Yeah. I just have to tell you, I can hear Dana. I'm like, that's, oh, that's my girl. That's, I love her voice, too. Okay, so, and because I am now putting these on, you know the message is coming, right? Oh, I haven't done it. Y'all haven't put the, put the glasses on yet. I tried to just fake it till I made it, right? But I'm done faking it. I need readers, okay? I need them, and I'm going with them because they're a dollar, a dollar tree, and I put them in every room. So, okay, so here's the thing. Um, our God does miracles. Our God does miracles. And here's the, here, I, I am so going to be spared like tonight. Okay, so I know that most preachers want their church to grow every month, right? Every week. This is like, and some, some people are just like, Mo is very weird because I prayed <laughs> for him to shrink the crowd this month. It's silly. I, and I know that's very weird, but I said, God, we're going to have see some miracles tonight. So just like you only took certain people in when you were going to do certain miracles, he only took a couple of his disciples that he knew believed enough. Lord, bring those people tonight. Bring the believers tonight that, that believe enough that miracles can happen. And so if you have to thin the crowd a little, Lord, thin the crowd. And so God, thin the crowd. And so I just want you all to know you're on the inner circle tonight, okay? You're on the inner second inner circle tonight. And I think God knew you had enough faith to believe in miracles tonight. And so that's why you're here. Because when the message is going to be on miracles, you're going to have to thin the crowd a little, y'all. I'm just going to tell you. We say we believe in miracles, but I'm telling you, it's until you really need to get in and start experiencing life do you really have to believe in miracles. Amen? Amen. And so let's stick to the script, Mo, because you're going to make stuff up. Okay. <laughs> Here's the thing. He's still doing miracles. God is still doing miracles. They're still happening here in the United States. Whether we think it's just in other countries or not, y'all, he's still doing them here. We just don't see them a lot or experience them a lot, mainly because of our pride. Yeah. Mainly because of our pride. And I know y'all didn't want me to say pride. You were like, oh, couldn't you have said busyness, Mo? Right? <laughs> couldn't you have said self-sufficiency? We just don't see it because, you know, we just, we're too busy. We're too distracted. Those kind of things. But I'm just going to tell you, I think at the center of all of that is pride. Because we think that our agenda is more important than God's Come agenda. Oh, and that is a little thing called pride. So tonight, I'm just going to tell y'all, we have made God's agenda our agenda tonight. And so I want to just commend you. Give yourself a spiritual pat on the back for pushing through whatever you had to to get here tonight. Because everybody faces the enemy when it's on Forsaken Day. You do. You do. I heard, you know, I you see it, and I'm like, here it goes. Here goes the enemy. I don't feel well today. And I love it. My Aunt Wendy's like, honey, I don't know if I'll make it. I'm not feeling well. My Aunt Wendy's sitting in the back. She pushed through. She made it, and I'm so proud of her. And I'm like, we have to fight sometimes, right? We have to fight the good fight of faith. So tonight we made God's agenda our agenda. And we don't have to keep doing this every month, y'all. We don't have to keep coming here and worshiping every month and, and lifting the name of Jesus high and renewing our minds in the word of God. We don't have to do that. We could be home sitting on our couch watching TV or watching movies, but you know what? We've made God's agenda our agenda. We made him important tonight. And we're lifting his name high tonight. And I am so thankful that we're doing that. Because when we do that, we see miracles. Amen. We see miracles. So let's go straight to our text. Because I want to see God move. We're going to be in Matthew 14. And we're going to start with verse 13. This is when Jesus feeds the 5,000. And I know we've heard this before, but we're going to have some fresh eyes tonight. God's word comes alive, doesn't it? Yeah. Sometimes we can read it. We can read it 10 years ago, and, and it doesn't come alive like it does. It is alive and active and breathing, and it's different every time we read it, and the Holy Spirit enlightens us differently. So we're going to start with verse 13. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them, and he healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, They don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass. 
Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and he broke the loaves. Then he gave them the to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men besides women and children. So you may be wondering when it says, when Jesus heard, right? That's how we started the text. When Jesus heard, well, when Jesus heard what? This is right after he heard about the beheading of John the Baptist. This is right after he found out that his cousin, John, his, the person that Jesus said, among those born of women, there's not one as great as John the Baptist. Jesus thought John the Baptist hung the He loved him. He's like, he loved him so much. It was his family. I think about it, and I was just kind of like pausing here for a moment. I was thinking, you know, it was his cousin. He was probably one of the only people Jesus could really relate to. John was a little weird, right? John was a little weird. He, you know what? The, the one other person in the world that was born with the Holy Spirit. That was John the Baptist. He had the Holy Spirit from birth. And so Jesus could understand him. And here's the thing. What did Jesus do? He was grieving. He was losing. He had just lost his cousin. He not only heard that his cousin had died, he learned that his cousin was beheaded. Beheaded, y'all. Think about that. You know, and what did he have to do? It says that he went alone to get with the Father. And so here's the thing. Jesus knew what he had to do when he was grieving, right? He knew what he had to do, and he went to get alone with the Father. And can I give someone a little advice here? Follow Jesus. Follow Jesus. Do what our Jesus did. Do what he did. When he needed strength in the middle of trials, he didn't do anything until he got alone with the Father first. He went and he went to have that needed time with the Father. He needed renewal. And y'all, maybe someone here needs to hear this. We need to do the same. If you need renewal, if you've been going through a hard time, if you've been struggling with something, maybe it's time to just go somewhere and get along with the Father. Because I'm going to tell you, we all need that. Take it from me. He is who we run to. He's who we run to. We have to jump into his loving arms and he, we need to go be with him so he can heal us. Yes. You know, we can, we grieve things. Jesus was grieving here. We grieve things. We grieve not only people, but we can grieve things too. Do you know that? We can grieve situations. Things can grieve our spirit. People leaving, people hurting. Things can grieve us. And you know, I have had that kind of week, y'all. I've had that kind of grieving week. And you can kind of tell, it's like, okay, this is how Unforsaken's going to feel tonight. Mo's been grieving this week, okay? But it's like, this is totally what has been going on. I've, I'll tell you, I've been grieving things. We, we have an amazing store. We have an amazing store. We're working our butts off to try to get people in that store so we can help women and children locally and globally. And you know my patience level, okay? I thought I'd look like Goodwill in 10 minutes, right? But you know what? It's like, I, we are working so hard and we're trying so hard. And like, there's been days when I'm like, we made $52 to that, right? And it, it grieves me. It was, I'm like, I'm grieving and I'll go to God and I feel like that's the only place you find your peace, y'all. Right. Going quietly to him and having him just calm me down and being like, oh, you need some patience. You've got to give it time to grow. And, you know, and, and I've gone to him about that. But y'all, then I'm also dealing with a real situation that we're grieving with Kimberly. Kimberly is a friend of mine. She is a close friend. She's been a leader here at Unforsaken. She is, I've known her for years. It's, I love her son. We are just, that, just thinking of her in a hospital bed in the ICU grieves me. And so I've had to spend tons of quiet time with the Father because I'm going to tell you, people try, y'all. People try to be really good at helping you when you're grieving. But if you've ever grieved the, the loss of someone, people don't know what to say, do they? They say really dumb stuff, okay? They say dumb stuff that they can't get back, and you need to just say, you should have just shut your mouth, right? You were not trained in this, okay? But the Holy Spirit has. 
has been trained in it. God is trained. He knows how to minister to us. He knows how to minister to us in our pain. He's our counselor. He's our mighty counselor. He's our friend. And because we, we serve a God who understands our hurt. So when we hurt, he hurts. When we're weary, he's weary. When we weep, he weeps. We serve that kind of God. <clears throat> Hebrews 13, 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The truth is, Jesus had compassion for hurting people. And he has compassion for us when we hurt. He has compassion for us when we hurt. When we hurt, Jesus hurts. And he's a loving, compassionate, humble God. When we go to God in our grief, we receive the comfort we need. He's our comforter. When we suffer, we also, listen to this, y'all, we all love saying we, we share in his resurrection. We have resurrection power. We do, don't we? But you know what? We also share in his sufferings. That's right. It's part of the walk. We share in his resurrection power, but we also share in his sufferings. Well, Jesus didn't have much time to deal with his grief, did he? He didn't have much time to deal with his grief. He went to go get along with the Father, and good thing he's God, right? Because here comes the crowds. They just see him, and they're like, oh, he had five minutes to himself. Just follow him, right? That's like, that's Jesus. He goes to get alone. He has some time with the Father, but then the people see him, and they still go to him. And have you ever been there, y'all? You think you're like... Ah, oh, you get your quiet time, you know, you're having some, having, you got Little House on the Prairie on, right? And you're like, this is going to be a quiet night. And in comes the grown kids. Yes. They're just like, what's for dinner? And it's like, oh, yes, you're home, I love you, but I only have four pieces of chicken tonight, right? But I mean, no, I love that. Brookie, I'm just kidding, you're always invited. Anyways, <laughs> but the thing is, like, Jesus didn't have much time, right? So he had to just be like, here comes the crowds. And so verse 14 says, when Jesus landed and saw the crowd, he had compassion on them, and he healed their sick. The first thing we can learn about miracles from this passage, we learn from Jesus. Miracles start at a place of compassion. Miracles start at a place of compassion. We see miracles when our faith stretches out and says, I've been where you are. I know how you feel. I know this is hard. Our faith stretches out to reach for a miracle when we place ourselves in the spot of the person needing the miracle. And we actually care enough to see them get the miracle because we've been there. We hear so many, don't we? All we see it on Facebook every day. We see people. People are begging for prayers, aren't they? They're begging for prayers. They're like, please pray. I woke up with a migraine. I, I, you know, that's just, please pray. My dad is in the hospital. Please pray. My family member's going in for a surgery. Whatever it is, we see the, pre, the please pray. Please pray, right? Every day. If you need prayer requests to pray for, go on Facebook. They're on there, okay? <laughs> and then the next thing we see, countless. Praying hands and hearts, right? Praying hands and hearts. Count hearts, yes, praying, praying, praying. And here's the thing. Can I get real for a second, y'all? Mm -hmm. Yes. I would venture to guess that 80% of those people that post those praying hands and hearts emojis, they did not take two seconds to stop and say, Lord, I'm lifting up this person to you right now. Y'all, I'm just going to tell you, if, in, if, if that is the case, I can't prove it, no, but I'm just telling you, we... When, when it's our migraine, right, when it's our migraine, when it's our family that's going in for surgery, when, when it's our city facing the Cat 5 hurricane, yep, when it's us who needs the healing, come on, we want real prayers. We don't want your praying hands emojis, okay, right? I don't want your praying hands emojis. I need to know that you really took two seconds and said my name, like Lisa said, say your name. Say Kimberly. I, want to, I don't even care. I don't even know half these people have the time, but I'll lift their name up. God knows. Yes. God knows what their need is. Yes. But I know that that's like, I'm not getting legalistic here, y'all. I'm just getting realistic. We need to be real about our prayers. We need to be real. That's why I said thin the crowd, God. We need to know people who are going to come in here really believe that miracles still happen. Amen. Because we need to be this. We need to, we need to, when we're waiting on the test results, when we when we're waiting on it, we ask for real prayers, we want real prayers. Yes. Right? Yes. 
Miracles start at a place of compassion. And that happens when you've been there. Right. When you've walked it, you have compassion. When you've dealt with things in life, you have compassion. Jesus had compassion on the people. He saw that they walked all the way there. They walked all the way there to be with him. They left jobs and homes and family members, and they got up probably on a Tuesday, and they were following Jesus. And they just did it, and he saw that. He felt for them. He knew. And then there's other areas in the Bible where Jesus it says that Jesus had compassion on the people because he saw that they were like sheep without a shepherd. He recognized their need for a leader. He recognized that they were lost. And when we felt like those people have felt on Facebook when, when they're reaching out for prayers, when we have felt what they felt, then we have compassion. When we felt it, when we walked in those shoes of someone, y'all, I'm just going to tell you, like, we just, we just faced that hurricane, right? So those of us who God protected us and made it through, and we saw what could have happened, y'all, right? Yes. That makes us have so much compassion on Puerto Rico. Yes. It makes us have so much compassion to think God protected so many of us. And yes, we were without power and without these, these what do we call ourselves? We're like a... I don't know, whatever. But without the modern day, modern day things that we all get so used to, air condition, that kind of thing. But y'all, devastating things are going on. People are are just not able. Like I just think about not being able to know if I could hear from my dad, right? right? Just knowing my dad was okay, knowing my family members were okay. We need to have compassion because we know what could have happened. That could have been us. It could have been us. But when we coveted those prayers ourselves, we know how it feels and we're able to have compassion. True miracles start at a place of compassion. So what does it mean to be compassionate? I want to go here for a little while. The definition of compassion is a feeling of deep sympathy and sorrow for another who's hurting, in pain, or had misfortune. It is accompanied by a strong desire to help the suffering. Jesus Christ is the greatest example of someone with true compassion. Not only did Jesus have compassion and heal people everywhere he went from physical suffering, he also showed the greatest compassion when he went to the cross, y'all. So we see here compassion, it isn't just a feeling of feeling sad for someone it's, that's in hurting or in pain. That, that The next part says, it says, first of all, that we have a feeling of deep sympathy and sorrow for another who's hurting. Then the next part says, there should be a strong desire to help in the suffering. Jesus had compassion on the people. He felt such sadness for them, that, that for their hunger, their pain, their fatigue. So he healed their sick. He had compassion, so he healed their sick. True compassion isn't saying, I'm so sorry you're hurting. True compassion Jesus type of compassion says, if there's something I can do, I'm going to do it. Amen. That's Jesus type of compassion. And there's a difference. Y'all, oh, let me go on this soapbox for a second because this is good. And this is from God because my auntie got the same word almost at the same time. And I think this is so God. But here is, there's a difference in awareness of a problem, Right? And steps taken to solve a problem. There's a big difference in that. And you can raise money. Let's have an example. You could raise money all day long for hunger awareness, right? I'm going to raise money for hunger awareness. We're going to have an amazing gala, right? That is what we're going to do. It's like, it's like people do that. You see things all the time. We're raising money for this awareness, this awareness. Okay, but if that's step one. Awareness is step one. But if we stop there, what good is it? What good is it? The book of James says, what good is it, brother, if you say to someone, be warm and well-fed, but you do nothing of their current circumstance? It, he actually says, that kind of faith without works is dead. It's dead. It's nothing. But when awareness takes a step, when awareness takes a step of faith and says, I I see you're hungry, I'm going to make a meal for you. Right? When awareness takes a step and says, I'm going to keep granola bars and blankets in my car in case I see a homeless person, right? When awareness takes a step and says, I need to build a food pantry, whatever it is. When awareness takes a step that takes us from pity to compassion. And there's a big difference. That's what, that's what takes us from praying hands and hearts emojis mm -hmm. 
to actually pray for someone. True compassion. I know we can't always do something, y'all. I know we can't always do something. I am a doer. I want to do something. I want to start a revival. You saw my darn video. I was like, wow, I had a lot of coffee that day. But I literally want to think that I always feel like I can do, but God has to tell me sometimes it's be still and know I'm God, right? Sometimes that the one thing, and it still is the most powerful thing to do, is to hit our face to the ground and pray. Yeah. And prayer is still the most powerful thing. If you say, I can't, I hate that. I can, there's nothing else we can do but pray. I'm like, oh, you're so lost, okay? <laughs> the first thing you do is pray, right? right. Sometimes God will give you the steps. Sometimes he'll be like, and now you need to start a food pantry, right? And now you need to do this. But sometimes the best thing, the most important thing is to truly pray. Yes. Miracles start at a place of compassion. Too real, y'all? Sorry. Okay, this is how I preach. Okay, miracles require a natural need, too. Miracles require a natural need first. Here's the thing, nobody in heaven, nobody in heaven is up there praying for a miracle. Okay, nobody's in heaven praying for a miracle. It's perfection. It's perfection. There's no tears. There's no sadness. There's no sickness. There's no, nobody even wears glasses because they're all perfect, okay? It's like, ever, there's no need for miracles in heaven. It's perfect, but it's not perfect here. It's not perfect here yet. We have natural needs. We still have natural needs. We live in a fallen world, and there is an enemy of our souls that his most important thing the devil wants to do is thwart God's plans of your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's what the enemy wants to ruin, right? So, yes, we still have trials here. We still grieve here. We are going to struggle. Jesus is going to come back. Your kingdom come, your will be done. It will happen. Jesus is going to be return, returning. But until then, we're going to have troubles, y'all. Jesus says in this world... You will have trouble, but take heart. I've overcome the world. We need Jesus to be overcomers, right? Yeah. We need Jesus to be overcomers. Miracles here on earth have to begin with a natural need. Maybe we need healing. Maybe we need food, right? Maybe we need provision. Maybe we need deliverance from a habit or a hurt or something we've struggled with for a while. Maybe we need the great physician. Or we need wisdom in an area. Or we need deliverance in an area. We have natural needs. And miracles require a natural need to happen. And then when that's met, we know a miracle's happened. Right? When that natural need gets met supernaturally... We know a miracle happened. Let's read on. As evening approached, this is verse 15, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages, buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. Okay, here's the natural need, right? Right? We see the natural need. This is the need for the miracle. It's dinner time, and there ain't no Chick-fil-A. Okay? <laughs> That's the natural need. There's a bunch of hungry people here. And the crowds, I'm thinking, you know, they're like, we've seen this in the crowds before. They're hungry and pretty soon going to be hangry. Right? <laughs> they're pretty much getting hangry soon. And there's one, that one pastor, Mo, she starts out a pastor. She gets hangry. She's like the Snickers commercial, right? <laughs> so let's get some food going, Jesus. That's our plan, right? So we have a natural need. And so Jesus says, they need some food. They say, Jesus, we, they need some food. Let's send them away, right? And, and I love what Jesus is like. Uh, we don't need to send them away. You feed them, right? Come on. <coughs> Here's Jesus getting real, right? He's like... Knock off your praying hands and hearts emojis, okay? And let's do something, okay? Stop the pity, show some compassion. Jesus places the miracle in the hands of the disciples. And he says, figure it out. And so um, here's the thing. Sometimes God does this, does this with us, right? He places it in our hands because guess what? We have gifts. We have abilities. We have anointings. 
We do. God's given them to us. And he's like, what are you going to do with these? I want to see you be vessels, using these vessels, using these gifts to be my vessels, right? Amen. So I can work some miracles in and through you. So um, enough awareness. Let's show some compassion. So Jesus tells them, you feed them. And what do they say? They say, well, we just got a tiny bit of food, right? We got these five loaves, these two fish, and... And, and I love this because Jesus is like, bring them to me. Right? Come on, guys. You know, he's like, bring them to me. Here we go. We have to take our compassion. We have to take our natural needs. And we got to take them to Jesus. Amen. That's what we have to do. We've got our compassion. We know what we have to do. We know we have to do something. And there's a need to be met. And we have to do what we can do. And then when we've done something in the natural, but we know we need something supernatural, right? we got to get them to Jesus. So we lay our needs at his feet, and we come with whatever we have. They came with the five loaves and the fishes, and they were like, this is what we have. And we come to him, and we say, Jesus, i got this need, and this is what I have. I'll give you my hard work. I'll give you my sweat. I'll give you my tears. I'll give you my offering. We place him at Jesus' feet. And then the third thing we know about miracles is, Miracles happen because of Jesus. He says, bring them to me. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves, the two fish, looking up to heaven. He gives thanks. He breaks the bread. Y'all, we've seen that somewhere else, right? We see it at the Last Supper. He takes them. He breaks the bread. And he gave them, he, he breaks them, he gives them to the disciples, and they gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate were about 5,000 men, besides women and children. Y'all, I'm just going to say, i got to go off like in a different tangent than what I was going to write here. When you hear, like, they all ate and were satisfied, right? When Jesus does a miracle, we don't just eat and we've just filled our bellies. Just enough, right? He's not the God of the just enough. He's not. We are going to eat and we're going to feel satisfied. That just, like, that is how he is. We and there's going to be more left over. There's going to be overflowing miracles, overflowing blessings. That's him. That's what he does. When God works a miracle in and through us, it's Jesus doing the miracle, not us, y'all. Amen. Not us. The Holy Spirit does the miracle. When we bring God the needs, we serve the needy. You better believe those disciples had to pick up the baskets, right? They had to pick up the baskets after. It says, and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. They had to clear the table, right? Come on. They had to bring Jesus the need, Jesus does the miracle, and they do the dishes. Right? That is how it goes with God's miracles, y'all. We have more parts to play. That's our job. We are to be the ones that see the need for compassion. We show the compassion. We see the natural need. We bring it to Jesus, and then we, we help them afterwards. And that sounds so, like, it, it, this is our job. We take it from pity to compassion. We try to do whatever we can in the natural, but then when we need something supernatural, we bring them to him. And I thought about our job in the miracle working business, So, and I thought, we're kind of like miracle marketers, okay? This is who we are as, as Jesus' believers here. We're miracle, miracle marketers. we got to get the people to Jesus so he can do what he needs to do. I think about our store, right? I mean, we got an amazing store, but if we don't market the store, we don't have road frontage. Nobody's just popping and being like, I hope there's a thrift shop here, right? No, we got to get people to our store because you're not going to see our beautiful store unless we do some marketing. So we, same thing, we have all of the beautiful gifts. We have Jesus to offer them, right? Right. But we got to market it, y'all. We are the miracle marketers. That's our job. How are we doing any earthly good for people if they have needs for miracles, but we don't get them to Jesus? We bring them to Jesus, then we allow the Holy Spirit to do what only the Holy Spirit can do. It's the Holy Spirit doing it, y'all. And then we serve them after. 
We do the serving after. It gets real quiet when you say serve, right? Come on. We don't get excited about doing the dishes, do we? Right? <laughs> but we, that's what we are to do. We don't just get people saved and then leave them. We gotta disciple them. We don't just get people to believe God for their healing, get them to a healing thing, bring them there, and they get healed, and you're like, you're like, you know, hey, so glad, so glad you got healed tonight. See you later. Call me next month. You know, that's not it. Then you teach them, hey, this is Jesus who just healed you. Let me show you how to serve him, right? We got a disciple. We don't just go to God for miracles, signs, and wonders, and then go back to our normal selfish life the next day. We don't. It's got to change us, y'all. We put on our work gloves, and we pick up the leftovers for God. Jesus does the miracle. It's not us. But you, listen, we do have the authority, right? We have the authority in us as saved, baptized believers to walk in all the gifts of the Spirit, to... We have the authority to preach the word and lead people to Jesus to a life eternal. And we have the authority to lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. We have the authority to tell demons to flee because of the name of Jesus and they have to flee. We have the authority to do greater works than the disciples and Jesus even did when Jesus walked the earth. We have all this authority. But the authority is only ours because of Jesus. It's only ours because we carry Christ. It's Jesus who does the miracles, not us. We bring the needs to Jesus. He does the miracle. Then we serve him faithfully. You know, Jesus even says, I didn't come into this world to be served, but to serve. We're called to serve. We're called to pick up the 12 basketfuls of leftovers and go about serving. I think about the leftovers. Let me talk about the leftovers for a little bit here. Um, What am I talking about with the leftovers, y'all? I want to ask you a question. The day that you gave your life to Christ, when you made him Lord and Savior, when you made your commitment for Christ, that day, did everything change? No. Nope. Did your thinking change? Did your inclination to sin change? Not so much, right? Nope. I'm going to tell you, because we have some leftovers of our sinful nature left over. The only thing that changes when we accept Jesus Christ is our spirit. Our spirit becomes perfectly, amazingly, exactly like Jesus. He implants the Holy Spirit inside of us. And the Holy Spirit is just as perfect the day you received it as it is today. It's just as perfect today as the day you received it. It never changes. It's perfect. It's the Holy Spirit. But... Our soul and our body needs a little work, right? <laughs> our spirit's perfect, but our soul and our bodies, they're, they're just operating in leftovers right now. Leftovers from our sinful nature. Our spirits are perfect, but our soul and our bodies, our soul, y'all, is your mind, your will, your emotions. Those things only know what they've ever known. Sin. Sinful thoughts, greed, selfishness, that kind of thing. And then our bodies, it gets its cues from the five senses. They only know that. So so then what do we do about this? What do we do about this? Well, listen, our souls and our bodies have to be renewed. They have to be renewed. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your minds. That's why we meet every month, y'all. That's why we sit here. That's why we dig into the word to renew our minds in the word of God. We are to do it daily. Daily. Galatians 5.24 says, Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified their sinful nature with its passions and desires. The word teaches us to renew our minds and crucify our flesh daily. Do not operate in the leftovers of our sinful nature. Turn to your neighbor and say, renew your mind. mind. Turn to your neighbor and say, crucify your flesh. flesh. And Jesus does his miracle. It's up to us to pick up the leftovers of our sinful nature, renew our minds, crucify our flesh. It's a daily thing, y'all. Miracles start at a place of compassion. Miracles require a natural need. Miracles are done by Jesus In us, not us. But tonight I want you to remember one more thing. Father God is the miracle. Jesus is the miracle. Holy Spirit is the miracle. God the creator, the one who holds this world together by his beautiful word, he is the miracle. He's everything to us. God sustains us when we're hurting. God 
heals us when we're sick. God comforts us when our when we're grieving. He empowers us when we're insecure. God is the miracle. Yes. Amen. He's supernatural. And just walking in his will is to live a supernatural life. Psalm 94:18 reads, "When I said, my foot is slipping, your love, O Lord, supported me." Amen. Psalm 103, 3 through 4 says, it tells us to praise the Lord who forgives all our sins, heals all our diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, y'all. Who knows what it was like to be redeemed from the pit Amen. and crowns you with love and compassion. Amen. God's the miracle. It's a miracle that he created all this. It's a miracle that we even have this earth, that he sent his son to us when, when we wrecked it with sin, right, y'all? He decided, I'm going to send my son and he's going to fix it. It's a miracle that he came, he lived a sinless life, and then he died and took our sin on him and resurrected. And now we have the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's the miracle, y'all. Amen. That's the miracle that the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of us to guide us in all righteousness. That's the miracle. God's the miracle. And it's a miracle he allows us to see the miracles here on earth. It is. It is a joy. It is a privilege to be a part of one of God's miracles. We need to count that such a joy. And it has to be for one reason, one reason only, and it is for God to get the glory. Amen. That's it. God has to get the glory for every miracle. That's it. That's why miracles happen, to lead people to God's glory. That's it. It's him who does it in us. It's him in us, not us, shall. Mark 16, 17 through 18 says, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Signs and wonders should be part of our everyday life as Christ followers. It should. But we have to read it. Remember what it says there. It's to be done in his name. It's in his name. They're done by him working in us. And they're done to glorify God and God alone. So we're going to have some prayer at the end of the evening tonight. Um, and I believe that God's going to do some miracles tonight. We have, I've asked, specifically asked a couple women to come down and be prayer partners for us tonight. Um, but we're going to, we're going to believe for God to be just what he is, the God of miracles. We prayed and made Lisa's prayer for Kimberly. I know something happened in that room tonight. I know it did. I know it did. And I can't wait to hear. I cannot wait to hear. But we have people that we need to be praying for Puerto Rico. We need to be praying for, for these other countries that are that are still struggling with everything that from our hurricane and people in Florida and the Keys, everything. We have people that you may have come tonight. You may need healing. You may need deliverance. Whatever it is, come boldly to the altar tonight. Yes. Come boldly so we can go boldly to the throne of grace. Amen? Amen? But we need to remember that miracles start when we have compassion. Real compassion. And miracles require a natural need. Miracles happen because Jesus is in us, not us. And God's the miracle. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Amen. You, Heavenly Father, we love you so much. We praise you and we thank you for this night, Lord. I thank you for the women that are here. I know you are doing amazing things, God. I know what you've already done tonight. I, I, I don't know what it is, but I can't wait to find out, God. I thank you for the, for the supernatural God you are, Lord, that you choose, but God, you choose to use us natural beings, Lord. It is amazing to me. It is amazing that you chose to send your perfect Holy Spirit to live on the inside of us. God, we are so grateful. We are so thankful for that gift of the Holy Spirit. God, we talked a lot about grieving tonight, and I pray if there's anyone grieving something that they know they can go to you and you will counsel them, Lord. Your word will heal them. He sent forth his word and it healed them. God, I've seen you heal so many things in my life through your precious word, your precious spirit, Lord. God, I pray that who, whoever needs that time with you, that quiet time, whatever they need to do, they can hide in the bathroom, whatever it is, God, whatever they have to do to get quiet with you, Father, so you can heal them, you can restore them. Lord, we pray this. I pray for 
whatever miracle people are are hoping they came for tonight, I pray that they come forward and they ask. And Lord, your word says you have not because you ask not. I pray they come forward and they believe that you can do it. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you that uh, one scripture about the five loaves and the fishes, Lord, that, that it's different to us every single time we read it. That, Lord, you brought fresh eyes to this. And I thank you for that. I thank you that your word is active and alive. A double-edged sword, Lord. God, I just pray right now for... I pray right now for what we support here at Unforsaken, Lord. I pray for the women that... that I, I wish I could share with all these women all the time. The, the private messages I get, God, the private messages saying, thank you, this has helped me so much. These videos help me. This word helps me. The, the, the book helped me. Whatever it is, because, Lord, we need to renew our minds. We need to renew our minds. We need to not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. I thank you for your beautiful word, healing these women all over, God. But all, mainly, I just thank you for the women that are here tonight, that they made your agenda their agenda tonight. God, I just praise you, and I thank you for healing. I thank you for restoration. I thank you, God, that you are the God of miracles. We love you, and we praise you. And I pray right now for our missions that we support, for the single moms we support, for their kids we support, God. We we thank you for the widows that we support. We thank you for, Lord, the, the school in Haiti that we support, God. They're yours, and we trust you with them, Lord. We trust you. We bring whatever we have, this little offering we have, and we bring it to you, and we just know that, Lord, you, you multiply it. You do what only you can do. We praise you, God. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen.